Welcome to the Bridge Church, the church that connects faith and life. Join us each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. You can visit us in person at 976 East Keitel Street in Cleveland, Georgia, or join us online for our live iCampus service at www.thebridgeonline.cc. Yeah, so if you can't tell, we are talking about Mission Impossible today. It is so good to have you here at the Bridge Church. What a great looking uh, congregation that's here in the house. If you're joining us online from somewhere, really, really good to have you. Thank you for starting out your year with us. Today, I'm going to be talking primarily to believers. So if you are a, a non-Christian skeptic, if you're kind of the jury's out, if it's something where you've left your childhood faith a long time ago and you've really not really wandered back and you're here for other reasons, and you think that maybe Christians have an agenda, today you'll find out that we do, okay? And I'll just tell you all about it. And you will find out, you know, really what is the heartbeat behind uh, what we believe and, and what we feel like God has called us to do. So I'm going to be talking mainly to believers, but I hope that all of you, I'm trying to deliver it in such a way that everybody here will, will benefit in some way and you'll hear God's voice speak to you. Because, you know, when you look at what Jesus expects from his followers, it is humanly impossible. I mean, think about this. If you look at Jesus' expectation of his followers, what he wants to do in us and through us, it is humanly impossible. I mean, just consider the personal transformation that he wants to do. When you take someone who's full of hate and, and, they, and they become a person that's full of love, someone who is very racist and bigoted and they become very inclusive, if you take someone who is greedy and self-centered and they become very generous and concerned for the needs of others, if you take someone who is addicted to all types of vices, and they find freedom and liberty just looking at the personal transformation. It's humanly impossible. I mean, think about it, people. If we could have done it, we already would have, right? If we could have changed, if we could have already lost the pounds, fixed the budget, fixed the marriage, fixed the kids, got rid of the addictions, if we could have, we already would have. But we know how impossible it is. But I want us to look at the communal transformation of what Jesus has called us to do. When you look at what Jesus Christ has called his followers to do together in community, it is humanly impossible. Here's how I wrote it down. First of all, he wants us to come together and unify around two of the most divisive issues. Two things that you don't talk about at Thanksgiving dinner table with family. Two things that you don't get together at Christmas and want to have conversation if you want to have peace. And that is faith, what to believe. He wants us to come together and unify on what we believe about life, about sin, about God, about eternity, about judgment, about righteousness, all these things. He's wanting us to agree, and it is impossible to get people to agree on faith. And then he wants us to come together and unify on how to live life, faith and life. I mean, listen, if you really want to cause an argument around your family, start telling them how to live. Isn't that right? Okay, listen, some of you older parents, I mean, your grandparents, you really want to start a fight, tell your kids how to raise their children. And so he is asking us to come together and unify over the issues of faith and life, which are two of the most divisive issues that we have out there. And not just that, he then wants us to go out and to propagate, to spread ancient stories and ancient teachings that a large part of the world have considered too impossible to be true. I mean, things like a virgin birth, a creator God, resurrection from the dead. He wants us to spread stories that are too impossible to be true and to put our life and, and base our life upon that. Then, 
He wants us to engage people in culture and to engage them in such a way that it results in not only changed lives where their lives are being changed, but changing entire cities, entire communities, and literally to change the world. This is what Jesus expects of his believers. It's impossible, isn't it? I mean, when you put it like that, let's just all pack up and go home. Because I'm not sure that we're ever going to pull that off. And I want you, okay, those of you who are believers, you've read the Bible, you've seen some stories or heard some stories. But I want you to listen to this as if you were there that day that Jesus delivered these instructions to his first followers. It's Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Okay, how many people would it take to change our community, to really impact our small city? Okay, he's got 72, and he's going to split them up two by two, so there's only two going to be in the city. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Okay, it is a right time for the message, for the ministry Everything is right. People are longing for something. They're wanting somebody to come in and change some things. But there's nobody to go out and deliver that message. So I want you to pray. And then here's what he says. After you're done praying, go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Now that right there is not a good marketing strategy. Okay? I want you to sign up to get shot down. That's what he's saying. Okay, I'm going to send you out there and they're probably going to shred your message. They're probably going to run you out of town. It is not going to be a friendly environment. He knows how impossible it is for us to accomplish what he has sent them out to do. He knows that. He's acknowledging right up front when somebody says, they'll kill us. And he's like, yeah, probably. Man, there's no way this is going to work. I understand. It's like lambs going out to wolves. Now, if you consider that everything that the gospel writer Luke, the historian Luke, if you consider everything that he's already recorded Jesus having done, it is very likely that this conversation and these instructions are given a year or more into Jesus' ministry. So this wasn't right up front. They have already seen him. In fact, the way that passage starts out, it says, after this, the Lord gathered them together. After this, after what? After he's taught on the hillside, after he's done several miracles, including raising of the dead, after he has taken a couple of his disciples, three of them actually, up to a hillside, and they saw him in his you know, transformed glory as the Son of God, speaking with Moses and Elijah, who had already been dead and gone for a long time. After all of that, after they've seen him cast out demons, after he's already taken 12, appointed them as apostles, and then sent them out with the very same instructions in the very same manner, after all of this, he now broadens the circle to 72, and he puts them in pairs, and he sends them out to everywhere he is going to go. Now, I love this because when it says go, I'm sending you out like lambs. Remember he said, now's the right time. I want you to pray that God would send somebody. And then when you're done praying, I want you to get up and go. You know what that tells me? We are included in the answer to our prayer for God to send somebody. I know some of you just got done spending some time with family or avoiding family, however you celebrate your you know, holidays. And you're probably thinking, some of you who are believers, man, I wish God would send somebody to my daughter or my uncle or my parent or my whatever or my neighbor. Who, God, I just wish you would send somebody. And he says, yeah, you're right, because the time is right. They need a change. They want a change. They might even be looking for change. So why don't you pray for God to send somebody? And then when you're done praying, get up and go. Because here's what he's saying to his believers. Yes, you need to pray for God to do something. And for God to send somebody. But you need to realize that you are part of the answer to your own prayer. So I want you to get on your knees and pray like it all depends on God. Then I want you to get up and go. Because it partly depends on you to go. You see, he, he goes on and says this. Do not take a purse or a bag, in some translations a staff. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. And do not greet anyone on the road. Now, when he says don't greet anyone on the road, he's not talking about hospitality here and denying people hospitality. What he's saying is, listen, don't get caught up in little side conversations. In fact, this, if you go back to the context and the culture in which they they lived and all this happened, 
there were itinerant preachers and teachers and philosophers who would travel from city to city. And they would you know, set up shop for a little while and they would do their teachings and everything else. And then they would go along and they would try to share their worldview and their philosophy and all. And he says, I don't want you to be like them because, see, they're constantly on the move. The, the staff or the traveling bag is an indication that they're not setting down roots anywhere. They're just constantly moving through. In fact, if they stop on the road, not just with a greeting, but to get into a conversation, if they find someone who will lend them an ear, they may forget what town they're going to, get wrapped up in this conversation and go somewhere else. And Jesus says, no, I'm sending you specifically to places I plan to go. In, in other words, I'm sending you to places that God is already at work. And that he's wanting me to go and reveal God's activity. I'm sending you specific places and specific people. And I don't want you to get sidetracked with conversations on the side of the road and someone else. But here's the other thing. I don't want you to carry a purse like with the extra money and all of that. I don't want you to be self-reliant at all. Because that's how these, these itinerant preachers and and philosophers were. See, they thought that you had to be self-sustaining, self-reliant. You weren't dependent on the system. You weren't dependent on others. You weren't dependent on community. It was just you and God or you and whatever God or just you and your thoughts. And they wanted to be totally independent, self-reliant. And Jesus says, no, that's not how I want you to go. I don't want you to go self-reliant. I don't want you to go like you're passing through. I don't want you to have an extra pair of sandals so that you can just hit the road and keep going. I want you to settle down. I want you to take up residence. I want you to put in some roots. He says, when you go to these places, you're going to start by forging relationships, friendships, partnerships. By not having a purse and extra money, you're going to be vulnerable. But here's the other thing. You're also going to be dependent on others. See, we don't see it that way, do we? A lot of times believers, they want to go out there and it's like, I'm on the scene to save all of you. You need me, I don't need you. But Jesus says, no, 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 I'm going to send you into a community and you're going to need them as much as they need you. See, you may have a message about how to live in eternity, but they're going to be your key on how to live tomorrow. And you're you're going to have to work together on this. I've actually done this experiment several times with interns. And we'll talk about this passage, and then I'll say, so here's your project for today. Do not take any money. Do not bring anybody back to the church. But I want you in pairs to go out across this city into Gainesville and wherever else I can send you. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to find needs, and I want you to fill it, and I want you to talk to people about God. I don't want you to carry any extra money. If somebody says, well, you know, the one thing I need is I need some extra money, don't send them back here to the church. I want you to go and I want you to talk to people about God. And this is what's interesting. If you went to a town that you were not from and you did not know the people, you would not go with a soapbox and a Bible in your hand to open a storefront church. You would go in and try to figure out, where am I going to spend the night? Where am I going to get my next meal? And Jesus says, and realize where you spend the night and where you get your next meal depends upon your hospitality and your ability to develop relationships. You can't go in there with the arrogance and the attitude that you've got all the answers because the first question you have is, what am I going to eat and where am I going to sleep? And they have the answer to that. He goes on, listen. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it'll return to you. What does that mean? If I just say, hey, look, I've come here in peace. I don't care who you are. Get out of here. I'll take my peace with me and leave. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's all he's saying. Just, just let it just bounce off, come back, and move on. God bless you. Stay in that house. If this is a, a house of peace, stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you. Boy, I could do a lesson right there because I've had like, you know, students who have come into an internship program, they go to stay in a home opener, and somebody puts a, oh, I don't like that. Oh, I don't eat that. Do y'all happen to have any, you know, you eat what is put in front of you. You are very gracious. He is giving, listen, he's giving these people some life skills here. This isn't super spiritual. This is very practical, isn't it? Eat whatever they put in front of you. For the worker deserves his wage. I love that. And you're going to earn it. You're not there at the Holiday Inn. Leave the house better than you found it. Clean your room. Clean the bathrooms. Take care of the yard. They're going to feed you and house you. And you are going to serve them. Do not move around from house to house. 
Stay there. Forge relationships. Here's what Jesus is saying. I want you to go deep, not wide. See, we think as Christians that we have to go wide and we have to go into a town and there's 400 people and we got to talk to all 400 people. And he says, I don't want you to do that. I want you to find one house. Now, these towns would have been very small. In fact, the hometown that Jesus grew up in, Capernaum, or where he was raised and where he kind of established his ministry base, probably had 150 to 250 people living in the town. It's not even a town. It's a neighborhood, right? Everybody knows everybody. Most of them were probably related. Again, a lot like White County, okay? So here's the thing. Listen, when they go into these areas, a small community, and they were saying, you don't have to go from house to house to house to house to house and talk to everybody. Don't go wide. Go deep. When you find someone who has peace and opens their home, establish some roots and some relationship and serve them in such a way that this relationship grows and the trust is built. And then they will hear what you have to say. See, we want to go wide, and we want to have ministries that expand all across the globe, but we don't go deep. We have very shallow ministries, very shallow discipleship, very shallow messages, because we don't go deep into what's going on into individual people's lives. When I preach up here, listen, the mass number of people that I'm talking to right now and that will see this later, I don't know every detail of what's going on, but this is why it's important you get in a growth group or a small group because there are some people who will know the ins and outs of your marriage and your kids and your work, and you go, well, that's the very thing I want to avoid. You want a shallow faith. And Jesus is saying, look, don't bounce around. Just dig in and go deep relationally with someone to help them. Why? Because you're going to help them identify where God is working in those issues and those areas of their life that we would never know if we don't go deep with one another. We'd never see it. He goes on, listen. When you enter a town and you are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Then he goes on and says this. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. Heal the sick. Imagine you were there for the first time. You're like, okay, Jesus, we've seen you heal the sick. And we've heard you teach and talk about the kingdom of God. You're now asking us to go and deliver a message that we don't fully understand ourselves. I mean, do you realize this? He has, hey, listen, other than the three people who saw him on the mountain, Pete, James, and John, other than those three who saw him on the mountain transfigured, the others are not even sure he's the son of God. And as far as we know, he has not made those claims himself yet people are starting to connect the dots but he's not made that claim so it's not like they went out telling the story the way we would tell the story he's entrusting them with a message they don't fully understand that they've not really grasped in other words there is a huge potential for these 72 people to screw this up bad they probably gonna have some bad theology they're probably gonna have some bad doctrine some bad teaching they're probably going to say something that Jesus taught and they didn't hear it exactly right. Somebody's going to ask a question and they're going to go, well, I don't know. i got to get back to you. People are going to stump them with some hard issues, right? Do you realize if you're one of those 72, some of you are sitting here right now and you go, in fact, I was talking to somebody earlier who said they, that their friend only knew one Bible story. What if you were sent out to a community with that one story? That's it. Just, and then they go, well, I also heard the Bible said something. You're going, don't know. I never read that part. Hadn't heard that part. What happened? Listen, have any of you ever done inner city homeless ministry? What happens when you meet somebody there that you're going to change their world and they know the Bible better than you? Wow. And these 72 went out. So some of you who sit there and go, well, I believe in God and I believe in Christ and he's done a work in my life, but I can never say anything because I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I've not been to school and I don't know it all. I've never even read all the Bible. I've never even read all of one book of the Bible. So God can't use me. The New Testament's not even written yet. And these 72 are going out on behalf of Jesus to declare a message, a simple message, that the kingdom of God is near. What does that mean? I don't know, but don't it sound cool? <laughs> don't you want that? I think I do. I don't know what it means. You see, and they're going, and then he says, oh, and I want you to heal the sick. Oh, okay, problem, Houston. How are we supposed to heal the sick? Well, the same way that you saw Jesus heal the sick. What did he, he just prayed. But, but Jesus... That's impossible. And he says, I know. I know. And he didn't try to soft pedal it. He didn't try to make it easy. He said, I know. There's going to be sick people, and they're going to expect you to heal them. Heal them. And you go, but I can't do that. I know. 
And how many of us would have walked ourselves out of that situation, kind of got to the back of the crowd, whenever they split up and say, hey, man, tell me how it goes. I'm going back to the house. He had me up to heal the sick. And now I'm done. But here's what he's saying. I want you to meet needs that are impossible to meet without God's intervention. And when I look back at 2014, can I tell you, there have been times we have met needs of people that are impossible for us to meet on our own. It, during a year when our budget was flat or actually down below expectations, I'll just tell you right now, our, our budget was down below expectations. Can I tell you, because of partnerships and things that God aligned for us, not that we went out there and got, they actually came to us. They called us on the phone, said, here's what we want to do. By the time it was done and over, they said, forget that. We'll just give you the money and let you do it. Do you realize when our finances have done a little bit of this over the year, our benevolence has more than doubled and done this? It's impossible. It's impossible. In fact, you realize that someone who doesn't even attend our church shows up with a $5,000 check to help people in our community in the last week. How is that even possible? How is that possible? Because we could not humanly do it. And he says, I want you to go out there and I want you to look at the physical needs and the financial needs and the emotional and the spiritual needs. And I want you to meet the needs of people that's impossible for you to meet on your own. You're going to be dependent on their hospitality, and you're going to be, to be dependent on God's Holy Spirit. And then he says, I want you to give help and hope to people who need it, who will receive it where it's welcome, where it's needed. And I want you to give God credit. I want you to tell them the kingdom of God is here. I don't want you to tell them the bridge church is here. I don't want you to tell them that you're here. I want you to tell them that God's kingdom is near. God's kingdom, the place where he rules, where he reigns, where life works as it should, under the authority and the will of God. It's here. And this is what it looks like. And this is what it feels like. He goes on, he says, But when you enter a town and you're not welcome, go into the streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. But be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. He said, listen, don't allow rejection by some people to become a distraction from God's purpose. And how many times do we do that? Where, how many times do we carry the baggage of one bad relationship into the next one? Or we carry the rejection at one workplace into the next workplace? Whenever we go and we have the best intentions and the best motives and all of these things, and it just doesn't work, and the conversation that we had at Thanksgiving blew up in our face, they didn't like it, and we now say, I'm not going to talk like that to anybody else ever again. And he says, don't do that. Don't do it. You just sit there and say, you know what? I'm not going to carry the dust of this town. I'm not going to carry the scars, the memory. I'm not going to carry the baggage or the bitterness. I'm not going to carry any of that kind of stuff. I'm just going to leave it all here with you. That's with you. But I'm going to keep doing this. And I'm going to keep talking this. And I'm going to keep living this. Even though you didn't get it and you didn't want it. This is between you and God. I'm carrying none of this emotional baggage with me. But before I leave... I want you to understand, the kingdom of God is near. Your response does not affect or negate God's will. It doesn't. There are people who will say no, and God will still do what God's going to do. If you look back into the Old Testament, that movie that's out right now, Exodus, about Moses leading the people of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, right? But if Moses had said no, Israel was still coming out, and they were still going to the promised land. And there's people who may say no to the kingdom of God and to Jesus Christ and to God's will. And you may be sitting here today and you may say no, but that doesn't negate God. It doesn't mean he doesn't exist. It doesn't mean his kingdom isn't real. And it doesn't mean he's not going to accomplish his will and purpose. It just means you're going to be on the, left on the outside of that because you opted out. But God will do what God's going to do. So here I'm talking to all the believers here. Are you going to be one of the 72? Are you going to be one of those who step up and says, God's going to do. Jesus is here to do something. He's going to accomplish something. There are churches on every corner in this county, across this state, across this nation, around the world. Because God wants to do something. Are you going to be one of the ones that God does something through? I mean, that's the question we really have to ask ourselves. Because see, listen, your confidence does not come in winning an argument with someone. Your confidence comes in seeing the kingdom of God take root and come alive in you. When I look at where I am and where I know I could be or would be 
If God had not touched my life at, at six years old, at 14 years old, at 18 years old, at 24 years old, if God had not done some incredible work in my life over that period of time, I know how wrecked my life would be, how wrecked my relationships would be. Some of you have got the battle scars of that. You've got the reputation of that. And God has redeemed and reconciled. And God has brought you out of some things. I've been joking as I've talked to people today. It's 2015, people. Some of you, the odds were against you. You would make it here. Or that you would make it here on the outside of bars. <laughs> right? It's amazing what God has done. And so my confidence in the kingdom of God is not winning an argument and convincing someone. My confidence in the activity of God in Christ is not to see someone whose life was wrecked get turned around. My confidence in all of that is my life was wrecked and has gotten turned around. And the kingdom of God is an operation in my life. And it's good to have Jesus Christ on the throne, ruling and reigning. Here's the thing. Here's what, I, here's what I know. What God has done in you and what God has done for you, he now wants to do through you for others. Think about that. Think about that. I mean, look at the words there on the screen and see it. What God has done for me and in me, he now wants to do through me for others. Let's just look back at 2014. For some of you, it was your best year ever. I know. I got Facebook. I see it. <laughs> Right? You post all the pictures, you put all the things out there. I mean, for some of you, 2014 was the start of a new relationship, a new job. Some of you got a new home, a new house. Some of you, listen, physically and emotionally, you were healed in 2014. God did something to help you turn the corner physically from some, some real physical issues or from some emotional wounds. Some of you were delivered from addiction. You finally took that step. You got into a program. You finally reached out from hell. But you have now spent your first year or your first six months or your first three months or your first one month in 2014 clean. And you've turned a corner here. It's been your best year ever. You have been reconciled in some of your relationships. Things that were broken and damaged have started to come back together in 2014. Some of you, your finances have increased after a devastating economy and a loss of job. You got a new job or whatever, and now the, the, the finances are starting to build back up. Your lost retirement is starting to recover. It's been the best year for you or the best year in a long time. You've turned the corner to a very, very tough run of years. Some of you thrived because of God's mercy, His blessing, and His provision in 2014. And God wants to do through you for others what he did in you and for you in 2014. Now, there's others I know on the other side of that equation. It was your worst year ever. Some of you came out of 2014 and you've gone through a divorce. You've lost your job. You've lost your home. Some of you have all three. I know. I know. You've suffered emotionally. You've had physical setbacks, physical attacks, your health and got bad reports and your health's gone downhill. Some of you have strained or broken relationships that got fractured in 2014. You have financial loss, financial setbacks. You've endured the greatest pain. Some of you, several of you that I love dearly, endured the greatest pain that could humanly be experienced by losing a loved one in 2014. It's been a tough year. Tough year. And you survived 2014. Because of God's grace, because of God's comfort, because of his strength in those hard times. That's why you're here today. And now God wants to give that grace and that comfort and that strength that he gave to you. He wants to now give through you to someone else. So it doesn't matter if you feel like you're on the winning side or the losing side of 2014. We are here today because of God's activity in our lives. And what he's done in us and what he's done for us, he now wants to do through us for others. In John 17, 18, here's how Jesus said it. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. This is a part of his prayer. And he's praying to the Father. He says, Father, as you have sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. This word as does not mean that we were like taking on human flesh. We were already in human flesh. It doesn't mean that we, you know, kind of set our deity aside. We've never been deity and we'll never be deity. It doesn't say that it's going to happen in the same way. He is saying for the same 
purpose. For the same purpose that you sent me here. Why did Jesus come? To redeem, to reconcile, to heal, to restore, to bring hope. For the very same reasons that you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world for the same purpose. You see, followers of Christ, we share in his mission. We deliver his message. We continue his works. If you're a follower of Christ, and, and listen, we do a lot of sermons around here that will talk about improving our lives, improving our marriages, improving our families, improving our finances, improving all of those things, and, and, and the self-improvement. We do a lot of messages that are very practical about the personal transformation. But if your relationship with Jesus Christ is all about you having a better 2015 than you had 2014, it is an immature and insufficient and incomplete faith. Incomplete in that God wants to do something in you so that he can do something through you. He wants to do something in your marriage so he can do something through your marriage. He wants to do something in your family so he can do something through your family. He wants to do something in your career, in your job, in your schooling, in your finances so that he can do something through them so that he can pair you up and send you out to change cities and communities and the world. That's what he wants to do. And the way that happens is when you realize, if I am a follower of Christ, then I share in his mission and what he came to do. Then I have to deliver his message, and I have to continue doing everything that he did. That's exactly what he says. In fact, later on in John, he says it again in John chapter 20. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. They are locked behind closed doors. He shows up. I mean, it's just like, boom, there he is. It's after his resurrection, and he's in their midst, and he says, don't freak out, peace, peace. (laughs) But let me reiterate it. As the Father, for the same purpose that the Father sent me here, I am sending you. For the same purpose. God's mission to reconcile the world relies on people who will take risk or risk rejection and will take responsibility. Think about this. We just came out of Christmas, right? I don't know if you've ever thought about this. God, the the creator of the universe, the one who made us all, the eternal existing one who's bigger than we can ever know, decides to come into his creation through his son, Jesus Christ, take on human form to redeem and to save the world, to become one of us, to live life among us, to show us and teach us how life is to be lived in harmony with God and with one another, and then to die for us. Now, that's a great plan, and when you tell the whole story, but it all hinges, it all hinges and depends. If this is ever going to take off and work, it hinges on a blue-collar worker and his teenage fiance carrying this child. That God would take his plan for all mankind and lay the responsibility in the arms of a teenage girl who's going to be rejected. Can you, can you imagine? Because here's the thing. Mary is responsible for caring for this child, feeding this child, raising this child. Joseph is responsible for helping this child understand God's laws and God's ways and to grow into understanding his purpose and why it was made and his identity. Can you imagine taking on the responsibility of the God of the universe, plan for all of eternity, and it's your responsibility to feed him, to change him, to train him, and to protect him, and to care for him. I do, it blows my mind how God, who can do anything and everything, who does not need us at all, will take his plan and lay it in the hands of messed up, broken, limited, finite human beings. Blows my mind. You know, the Christmas story reminds us that God does this, doesn't he? That his mission and his plan and his will lays in the hands of people who are willing to risk being rejected and who are willing to take responsibility. Blows my mind. But that's exactly what he does. And it's not just the Christmas story, it's your story too. Because you're sitting here, most of you are sitting here today, you've got your faith in Christ because somebody took responsibility and they took a risk. They took a risk that you might reject the story and reject them. In fact, some of you, you did. You rejected a lot of people. 
Until you finally, you know, the Holy Spirit got a hold of you and you finally woke up. You rejected a lot of people, a lot of places, a lot of churches. You, you just avoided them all together. And people kept risking rejection and taking responsibility and telling you the story and inviting you back until you got it. Isn't that true? And how is it that the God of the universe, he didn't just show up in dreams and visions for most of us. He showed up in people who went out, who stepped up, who spoke up. Blows my mind. What if this year, what if our resolutions to lose weight, get in shape, save, invest, pursue a higher education, or a new career, a new job, to travel, to retire, what if all those resolutions, which are fine, they're good. In fact, God may be directing you to take some of those. But what if all of them became secondary and took a back seat to this one thing? Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. What if, what if we said as followers of Christ, you know, I've never really personally done that. Get a little money here and there. I attend a church, and I'm glad that they do it, and I kind of promote their stuff. Every now and then, I'll invite somebody new, or I'll bring a family member. But I've never really taken personal responsibility. Not to the point of risking something. But this year, this year, I'm going to take responsibility for that. This year, I, I, I want to bring someone into a relationship with Christ that they become not just a student. Disciple means student, but it's more than that. It's students who will take up the teacher's cause. Take up the teacher's mission. See, some of us would say, oh, I'm a disciple of Jesus, but you've not taken up his cause. You're not taking up his mission. You've taken on his teachings, and that's great. But that's kind of like when you go to high school, and you, you know, or, or with me, when I went and learned calculus. I hadn't used it since. <laughs> you know, I was a student. I learned it, but I didn't take on the mission. I just left it there when I finished the test. What if this year we make Matthew 28 our first and primary resolution? What if the first resolution we make this year is to spend our lives making him known to people who do not know him? Or making him seen by people who have not seen him and cannot see him and overlook him? Showing that he is real to people who think it's just an imagination. What if we made our resolution this year to reveal his power to people who deny it? What if this year our resolution was living for him in front of others who live for themselves? What if that was our primary resolution? I want to go back and say it again, but I want to say it a little differently. God's mission to reconcile my world relies partly on me. Partly on me. It, it relies on me doing something. If I want my marriage fixed... It relies partly on me. If I want my family straightened out, it relies partly on me. God's got to do his part, yes, but I've got to do mine. If, if, if my community, if my neighborhood, if my school, if my workplace, if, if it's going to be changed, it, let's get even bigger than that. If the world is going to be impacted and changed for Christ, it relies partly on me, not my church, not my pastor, but me. Have you ever looked in the scriptures, looked in the mirror and said, this is partly for me. I'm supposed to do this. Me. It's supposed to be my mouth talking about him to others. It's supposed to be my feet carrying the gospel and bringing it. It's supposed to be my hands opening out and reaching out and giving. It's supposed to be me bringing them along. Not just them. Whoever them are. What do you need? Let me, let me just ask. I start asking a question. Okay. What do I need to fulfill the Great Commission? Now, this is me as a, forget pastor, this is Patrick. Me as Patrick, what would I need if God said, I want you to go out and I want you to change the world. I want you to preach the gospel. I want you to, you know, make disciples, baptize them, teaching them everything. Okay, what do I need to make that happen? I can tell you what I need. It's the same thing that you need, same thing that I need. Here's, here's what I need, and here's what I believe you need. First of all, I need a vision. I need a picture. When I say vision, okay, we use that in corporate world a lot, church world a lot. You know, you hear about scriptures about that. What does that mean? I need a picture in my head of how things could be and should be, and it has to include me. See, see some of you have these weird visions. Your vision is how we should do things around here and how we could do things around here, but they don't include you. And it sounds like, you know, Pastor, you know what y'all ought to do? You, you've heard that, right? 
Sweetheart, you know what somebody ought to do? You know what I wish somebody at that church would do? By God, I just went and you get all of it. See, your vision doesn't include you. You got a picture for everybody else. Okay? God loves you. And you have a plan for everybody else's life. Isn't that how it works? But you got to have a picture in your head of how things could be and should be that include you. When you sit there and say, you know, I think we, th- th- our church ought to add this type of ministry because there's a group of people out there in our community that are unreached that I think if we did this, does that picture include you? Are you front and center somehow in that picture? And that's what you need before I ever get started, before I ever say, okay, if God has called me into ministry, I have to have a picture in my head of what church is going to look like, how sermons are going to be delivered, how we're going to operate and do all that kind of stuff. And I got to see myself on the platform. I got to see myself studying. I got to see myself having the conversations. I got to see myself developing the team. I got to see myself in the picture. Otherwise, it's just a dream and it'll never go anywhere. You know what else we need? We need resources. I'll be honest, it costs money to do things. Now, God has already provided for my involvement. He has. It doesn't mean, God, if you will help me win the lottery, I promise that I will give back money to help. He has already provided for you talent, abilities, gifts, skills, and yes, finances and income to some degree. He has already provided for you. We've talked about this many times. See, you think that everything you make, 100% of it's yours. No. God gave 100% of your part to you. That's 90% of what you bring in. He gave you an extra 10% so you could participate. You just did your math wrong, and you thought all of it was yours. 100% of the 90% is yours. But he gave you an extra 10% so that you could always participate in what he's doing. Always. And that's how this is supposed to work. Now, I don't get this. I do not understand this. Somebody will have to sit me down one day and explain it to me. I do not understand how people can love the ministry of a church, can love the preaching from a pastor. I know you do. I don't know how they can get so much out of it and think it is so great and never contribute to it. I just don't get it. I hear people, I've heard the stories, I'm going to get in your mess right now. I hear people and I hear stories about people who say, I love our church, I love our pastor, I love this, I love it, and it's great. But I don't give there, I give to other places. I love how Jeff Groves, he, our executive pastor, he explains it great. That's like saying, I love the food at McDonald's, but when I'm done eating, I go pay Burger King. <laughs> I just don't get that. I, I don't get it at all. And you sit there and go, oh, I just love our pastor, but I don't trust what they do with the money. Who you think's responsible and goes to jail if we do it wrong? I mean, come on. Yes, we've got a finance team and we've got elders, but nobody locks them up. That's not how it works. And so I just don't get it because you say, if we're really going to do the Great Commission, what do we need? We need money. We need resources. We need talent. We need gifts. We need abilities. We need stuff because that's just how it works. Jesus didn't say, I want you to go into these towns with nothing but the clothes on your back. He said, I don't want you to carry the purse. I don't want you to carry this. But he sent them in with a message and with gifts and talents and abilities. And he said to heal and use what he's giving you to do ministry. You know what else we need? We need a team. I need a team. I can't do it by myself. The Great Commission requires great co-missionaries. Missionaries who work together. That's what the Great Commission requires. We need people who will come together. And first thing that Jesus did when he comes on the scene is he starts assembling a group of followers. And then he picks out 12 and he shares the ministry with them. And then he takes 72 and he shares the ministry with them. And he gets so big and so diverse and all that. And he says, okay, I'm out, of, I'm out of here. You guys have it. It's better for me to leave because as long as I'm here, I'm just in one place. But when I leave, the Father's going to send the Holy Spirit to be in you and among you. And I will be everywhere. And you got this. And so we need a team that comes together and works. Creativity and ingenuity and increased amount of energy and faith and skills. Now, what is a missionary? A missionary is someone who takes responsibility for accomplishing the mission in a specific place. So when you say, you know what, I'm just going to do my part to accomplish God's will and his mission in my home, you're a missionary. 
When you say, I'm going to do my part to accomplish God's mission and God's will in my school, you're a missionary. When you say, I'm going to do my part to accomplish God's will and God's mission in this community, you're a missionary. If you go overseas, you're a missionary. See, you thought missionaries went everywhere else. No, a missionary is someone who takes responsibility for accomplishing the mission in a specific place. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit for just a moment as we come to a close about church membership. People have asked about membership. And we're going to take members in. Church membership is really about church missionship. It's not like joining the health club or somewhere else where, you know, what do I get out of this? It's not joining the book club where you get some discount. See, members always want to say, if I join, what do I get in return? Church membership is not about membership. It's about missionship. It's saying, hey, here's the mission that God has put this church on and what he's called them to do. And we're going to share in the responsibility of making it happen. Church members who share in the mission take personal responsibility for turning a vision into a reality. That picture we have in our head of what could be and what should be and what God wants to do. When we take personal responsibility for that and turning that vision into reality, then you have joined in the mission. That's what church membership's about. See, some of you want to join a church so you get to have a say-so. You get to have a vote. But then you don't contribute to the church. So it's interesting that you want to have a vote on how a church spends money that you don't give. Do you understand why the world calls us hypocrites? I'm just just going to be really honest with you. Because here's, here's a statistic that I pride myself on. Maybe you shouldn't have pride. I think it's holy pride. We have fewer members than we have attenders at the bridge. I'm really proud about that. Because I've been at churches where they have a whole lot of members and nobody shows up. Maybe they're all in the mission field. I don't know. But I think some of them are actually dead. (laughs) But here's what I love about our members. When I go down the list, and I see it, there are people who are involved in ministry. There are people who are giving of themselves, giving of their finances. There are people who truly do take responsibility and say, God's doing something around here. You can count on me. I am taking responsibility. I want to make this happen. Does everybody give the same? No. Does everybody serve the same? No. There's all these different levels. But you are hard-pressed to look down the membership list and find somebody who is absent. You are hard-pressed to find somebody who's checked out. You see, membership is really about missionship. Now, is membership necessary? No. Only in certain positions at our church are you required to be a member. Do we want to know that you're that bought in and you're that committed? Only certain levels of, of positions and all that. But is it really necessary? It's not absolutely necessary. You can serve. There's a lot of things you can do. You can lead a growth group. You can sing on the praise team. There's a lot of things you can do around here without being a member. So I'm not pressuring you to do that. But what I'm saying is, if you do feel that God has tugged on you and said, you know what, I want to be one of those who takes responsibility. Today's a day to make that known. It's not necessary, but it does signify to one another and to the world That we are together on the impossible, on the faith and life issues. That we have come together on mission, vision, doctrine, values, the faith issue, what we believe, we're together on. That life issue, how we're going to live, we're together on. It communicates that we are fully committed to one another and to, to the cause that Christ has called us. And that is to go out, engage the world in such a way that lives are transformed, to spread these ancient stories and teachings to other people so that we can see lives and communities completely transformed. Members commit to God and to one another. Here's what it is. If you're a member, you're committing to God, you're committing to one another, and even to our community, that you will pray. That you will pray and you will seek God's will and you will seek His face and you will ask for His Holy Spirit to guide us and dwell within us and move us and give us wisdom to accomplish what He sent us out to do. That you will invite, yes, if you're a member, that you are committed to inviting people to whether it's a service or whether it's a growth group, but an appropriate event or opportunity where they can hear the message. You can deliver the message. You can deliver the gospel. You can talk to them as Shane was doing up in uh, Gatlinburg with this young lady. You can do that wherever you are. I want you to do that. But you're also saying, and I want to invite you to become part of a movement, of a body of people who are searching out God, who are seeking after him and following Christ. And you're going to invite them. Now, let me give you a little hint here. Another church down the road did this. I thought this was great. All of you, if you're looking to invite, these should be little triggers in your ear, okay? Little triggers in your ear. Listen for the knots. 
I love this, knots, N-O-T-S, knots, three knots. Okay? They're not going to come up on the screen. You may want to write this down. If you're out talking to somebody and you hear three knots, this is a good trigger for you to invite them to church. If somebody says, I'm not involved in the church, or if they say, I'm not doing anything this weekend. You hear people at work say, or at school, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, I'm not doing anything this weekend. Invite them to church. When you sit there and say, hey, we're doing something at church. Oh, I don't go to church. I'm not involved in the church. Oh, not, not. Invite them to church. Invite them to something. Here's the other not. I'm not doing well. How are things going? Oh, I'm not going so well. Things aren't, things aren't going so well. When you hear that not, invite them to church. Here's the other one. Not prepared. I'm not prepared. Oh, my goodness, my girlfriend's pregnant. I wasn't prepared for that. I'm not prepared. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Just lost my job. Not prepared for that. Invite them to church. Okay, other things you're going to do. You're going to give. You're committing to give. You're committing to say, I will share of my resources and I will do it consistently and faithfully. I will start with percentage giving and do everything that I can. Why? Because the mission that God has called this church to do relies upon me. Not them, me. See, some of you will say it relies upon them and so you let them take care of it. But members will say it relies upon me. It relies upon me. And then you'll serve. You'll find a way to serve in, in, in the church community. You'll find a way to serve at the community at large. And, and, and it's kind of like going out, and it's not about the bridge, and it's not about you know, me or you. It's about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is near, so we're going to serve, and we're going to let people know. Now, here's what I'm going to ask. Listen, I want new members. If, if you joined the church, we didn't even do this last year, so I want to go back and kind of pick this up. If you actually became a member, you filled out the form. We have a, a blueprints manual. You understand all of that. You filled out the form, and you turned it in. If you did that in 2014, any time, the last couple of months, we've had several people over the last couple of months who have joined. If you've done that, I want you to get out of your seat, and I want you to come stand right here. I'm not going to embarrass you. You won't have to say a word. I'm not putting a microphone in your mouth. just want you to come and stand. If you joined in 2014, come right on up here and just kind of stand and stretch out across the front looking this way towards me. These are the people who joined in 2014. And it's interesting, as they come, I'm, I'm looking at every one of them and I can tell you where they serve and what they do. I can tell you where they serve and what, they, I mean, I love it. Some of the newest ones right here walk in and start going, can I change that light plug? That plug over there is broke. Can I, can I fix that wire? Can I start? And started taking responsibility. <laughs> thank you see that electrician see God has already provided <laughs> already provided now here's what I'm asking you if you are here and you said you know what I knew this was coming and I'm prepared today's the day that I plan to join the church I want you to be able to come with them right now come on if you're here today and you say I want to join there was a few of you some of you already slipped up here early I said come on look at this Look at this. And you know what's so beautiful is as I see people coming, I can, more than half of them, I can already tell. They're already doing this, they're already doing that, they're already doing that. They're already taking responsibility. They're already there. Okay, I want you all, if you will, I want you to turn and look at me, okay? I'm, I'm going to talk to you. You don't have to, to stare at them and all that. Okay? I would be remiss if I didn't tell you there's one other thing we need. Okay, you can have all the vision in the world. You can have all the resources in the world. You can have the biggest team in the world. A lot of organizations do that, and they're not churches. <laughs> If we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're dead in the water. I've told you this whole sermon, everything he's asked us to do, we're talking about life change. It's impossible. It's impossible. Kirk, I know your story. It is impossible. If God didn't get a hold of you, that you'd be standing here today, married man, with a baby in another one, you know, little new baby right there. Look at that. God, it's incredible. It's incredible. I know your story. So Derek, what God's doing in your life? But if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we're all dead in the water. You get that, right? Without his power, it does become mission impossible. Mission impossible. I want you to listen to some, a couple of verses that I left out. When I read the Great Commission, go into all the world, you know, baptizing them, making disciples, teaching them. I want you, I want you to listen to the two verses that I kind of left out there. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority... All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. If we don't have that power, we're dead in the water. We can't change our own lives, let alone impact the lives of others. Isn't that true? We can't. 
And he says, all the power and all the authority, all the financial power, all of the you know, social power, all the political power, all the spiritual power over demons, all the physical power over the sickness and the illness and all, all power. He says, I've got all of that power. It's been given to me. All the power in heaven and all the power in earth is given to me. And with all of that power behind us, he says, therefore, go. You're not going powerless. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And then he says this, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If you are saying, man, I just don't feel God in my life anymore. I don't sense the Holy Spirit in my life anymore. I just don't sense God. I mean, we, we go through these dry seasons. If you want to sense the presence of Christ closest to you than ever, it's going to be when you're going. It really is. It's going to be, as, as Shane was talking about, it's going to be in the conversation with the young lady who might want to kill herself because life is just terrible. And in that moment, you pray like you've never prayed before. You look for God like you've never looked before. And you sense him in ways you've never sensed him before. The closest you will ever be to Jesus Christ is when you're going in the name and the authority and the mission of Jesus Christ. You get that, right? So here's what I want us to do. I want us to close in prayer and I want us to pray for one another. Okay, if you are already a member and you've been a member for a long time, whatever, I just want you to stand where you are right now and I want you to stretch your hands towards them because these are the ones who are now putting their arms together and we are locking arms to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. Heavenly Father, God, I pray right now for every man, woman, teenager, student. Lord God, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would overwhelm us with your Holy Spirit, that Heavenly Father, our confidence would not be in our organization or the church or the ministries or the service. Our confidence would be that you are alive and working in us and transforming us. And you're changing us and we sense it. Heavenly Father, our nature is being changed. Our personalities are being changed. Our mindset, our worldview, our morality is all being transformed and conforming to your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we, that's what gives us so much confidence that your power is at work in us. Now, God, we ask that you would do through us for others what you've done in us and for us, that your Holy Spirit, Heavenly Father, would so just overwhelm us that in the marketplace and in the public streets, Lord God, people would notice it and sense it and be drawn. But Lord God, you would help us to be able to articulate your kingdom to them. That you would help us to be able to communicate what it means to have faith and trust in you. That we would be able to share our story, even the parts we don't want to share because they're so shameful and so embarrassing. But Lord God, that we will risk rejection and take responsibility and share our own stories in a way that gives people help and hope. Lord, I pray that you would do the supernatural through us. That people would come to faith in you and a life would be changed. People would be healed. People would be set free. They would be delivered. Marriages would come back together. Children who are away from their parents would come home. Parents who are away from their parents, you know, their older parents, Heavenly Father, would be reconciled wherever the, the fracture is and the wound is, Lord God, that through us you would heal. And we would give you the glory. This community and this world would be transformed. Lord God, that's our prayer. And that's our commitment to you, God, and our commitment to one another, and our commitment to this community. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. If you will, y'all just stay right here for a moment. Everybody will be seated for just a second. Today is a huge day because <clears throat> we have these two churches that have come together. And I tell you, it's impossible. I mean, it, it, churches just don't do that. And we've had two churches that, that for the last year or two have been praying about the future, about what's going on and, and what God wants to do in us. And we're both praying that, that somehow we would be you know, more effective and, and more energetic and more resourced and somehow that we would make a difference in our world. And I'll tell you, it started when the Holy Spirit began to speak to Pastor David Crow. And David was very sensitive to that. And he made huge personal decisions and sacrifices. I can tell you, as a pastor, my respect for him is so immense. Not because of 13-year track record, but because of one decision and the courage it took to make that decision. I, I'm blown away. I'm blown away. 
A few years ago, um, we celebrated our 35th anniversary, and we brought the founders of this church who started this church. All of us are here today because of this handful of people. Kenneth Thomas being one of them. He's one of our elders. He's here. This, this group of people who met in a living room and started something incredible. And here we are today. And so we, we came up with this award, the Bridge Award, you know, Bridge Church Founders Award, about those who help connect faith and life and do something pretty soon. And we gave all of the, the, the original founders that day. We've given, um, I think, one other elder that award because of significant sacrifices and contributions to helping the mission and the vision that God's called us to do to be furthered. And David and Lori, I'm going to ask, I know you didn't want to do this, but just suck it up, man. I want you to come up here, both of you. This, uh, this says, uh, the Bridge Church Founders Award presented to David and Lori Crow for 13 years of ministry leadership and personal sacrifice that united the Rock of Cleveland with the bridge. Just want to give that to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hold on. Stay right here. This guy's an incredible evangelist. Um, I've listened to several of his CDs that were left over there in the... <laughs> in the foyer. Um, I have never in my life heard of a man on the day he was resigning and stepping back, giving an altar call and seven people coming to accept Christ. That's incredible. And I've still got a lot that I can learn from him that I want to learn from him. And so I want you, if all of you will, I want you to stretch your hands this way and we're going to pray down God's blessing and favor upon them and that God would open doors of ministry and influence Maybe different than what he's ever had before. Maybe in ways that they've never even able to see right now. But they have changed and transformed. They've been a part of the transformation of so many lives. And there's so many more that are yet to be touched by this wonderful couple and their family. Lord God, I pray right now for this incredible man and this woman of God. Lord, they devoted themselves to you. You transformed their lives. Lord, their testimony is incredible. Lord God, you have used them in so many ways. There are so many people that are here right now today who would be far from you and hell bound if it wasn't for this man and this woman and their family. Lord God, the sacrifices they've made, the personal cost and investment. Heavenly Father has been into your kingdom and you've said there's not a single person who's given up anything in this life that they would not you know, be repaid even in this life. God, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be so alive in them and overwhelming in them in ways they have never even experienced before. Heavenly Father, that you would open up new doors of opportunity for them in your kingdom. Lord, that even as they go about their, their routines and their day, that there would still be these divine appointments and relationships. That both David and Lori would still continue to usher people into a relationship with you and into eternal life. That Lord God, you would help them to teach us and to show us those areas of giftedness those things that they, that they have learned and they've excelled in, which you have blessed them and anointed them to do. And that, Lord God, we would continue to benefit from all the spiritual gifts you've given them, all the experience you've given them. And Heavenly Father, your kingdom would go forward. Lord, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together, not just the churches, but for bringing the Ballington family and the Crow family together. And Lord God, I pray that the friendships and the relationships begun here will honor and glorify you and we'll win many people to your kingdom. It's in your name we pray.